Hello, good morning. We've got the best thing you can imagine for a second day of a speaking event. We've got a lightning round, which means you only have to listen for five minutes for each speaker. We've got uh, six or seven speakers. They're going to be talking about a variety of subjects. Uh, they're leaders and innovators in their field. They're going to be talking about free-to-play, about development, about e-commerce, and about live streaming. And so first of all, let's uh, invite up Roy Stasini from Mob Crush. He's going to be talking about the lives and the challenges facing live streamers. Good morning, everyone. My name is Royce. I'm with Mob Crush, and the topic for my lightning round talk is go live, get paid, um, solving for creators' problems. So where do creators fit in the ecosystem, right? You got game developers that create the games, you got the community of gamers who play the games, and you've got creator influencers to create content around the games and share it with the gaming communities. Let me run you through a day in the life of a creator influencer. So they would wake up in the morning, right, uh, grab coffee, and they would live stream to, to Twitch, uh, for example. And because they would get some tipping revenue, subscription revenue, and it could be you know, something or it could be nothing. And after a few hours of live streaming, they would grab something to eat. Um, if they have a YouTube channel, they will edit the video sometime in the afternoon, upload it to your YouTube channel, because that's where they get their advertising revenue. And they could derive a few something of, of, of revenue, or it could be nothing. And after that, like towards the latter part of the day, they, they now need to engage their community and audiences across social platforms, right? Like you got Twitter, uh, you got Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. So, at the end of all that work, like numbers of hours for, for, for that day, um, you do all this work and you've got some sort of revenue or it's possible that there is no revenue. In fact, we ran a survey of about 1,500 avid gamers, right? Um, out of this set, about 14% of those gamers currently live stream. But out of those who live stream, 85% do not make any form of money. Out of the total set, 80% said they would live stream uh, if there were some sponsorship and, and revenue involved. Uh, coincidentally, 96% of these avid gamers have played mobile games uh, out of their smartphones and tablets for the past 30 days. And 72% have said they will be motivated to live stream if there's an ability to connect to their followers and audiences across social platforms. So we looked at that data set and we thought, okay, how do we innovate on behalf of these creators, right? We've, we've heard the problems, right? If, if we can give them the ability to reach their audiences with one touch across social platforms, uh, give them exposure to our 24 seven gaming and esports channel that's available right now at about 25 million households, and then give them the ability to engage and talk to all their audiences across social platforms in a product we've, we're calling Unified Chat, right? And on top of that, how do we solve for the revenue side? So we've created a solution co called Go Live Get Paid, right? It's, it's a way for creators to dynamically insert campaigns during their live streams. Um, the campaign is viewable by audiences across different platforms, and we guarantee the view viewership and audience reach for these campaigns. This is an example of, of Go Live Get Paid. Uh, it's currently in beta, and I'll share it with you and, and run you through the elements. Like I mentioned, we've got uh, the uh, Pacific Rim Uprising uh, sponsorship going on in the stream right now from Universal Pictures. Thank you to them. We, right now, are actually going to watch a trailer, all right, a little quick trailer from the boys, right? And so, this boy, I'm just going to quickly roll. Ooh, okay. Hell yeah, brother. A couple minutes, we'll have another look at the next trailer, and then that'll be it for the stream. So uh, thank you guys for supporting my channel so that film companies like this can reach out and uh, actually sponsor the stream. It's really cool opportunities. Great. So, so that's an example. It's currently in beta. Uh, that's uh, Mr. Waffles um, live streaming, and the, the content there was for Go Live Get Paid with Pacific Rim. 
Uh, these are other examples that we're currently testing in beta. The one to the left is World of Tanks. Uh, you've got the, uh, the Heroes game right in the middle for mobile. And then the one to the right is Pacific Rim. So if you look at the elements, like, like I mentioned earlier, we help uh, connect these game developers, publishers, and brands using creator influencers to reach uh, their audiences and have it brought to these audiences in a very authentic manner. Right? The, the one on the right side is actually Pacific Rim with Rumbly Superset, uh, who's actually part of the audience here. So he's one of our creator influencers. Uh, go over and say hi to him today. And if you want to meet a creator influencer and, uh, and, and find out more about uh, their problems and, and how we're helping solve for those problems. Again, my name is Royce. I'm with Mob Crush. And thank you for having me today. Cheers. Thanks very much, Royce. Uh, coming up now is Mario Valle from Alt Adventures. He's going to be talking about funding and investing in uh, emerging markets. Hi, Mario. Hello, hello. Can you hear me, guys? Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Houdin and Gamesbeat for having me. Uh, I've been working in the industry for 20 years now, and I left uh, 18 months ago, I left EA to start this venture capital fund called Alt Adventures, and we're supporting indie game developers throughout all the world, but with a special focus, because we think that the future of games, or part of the future of games, is with the indies from these particular territories. And I will try to explain why with uh, three brief ideas and three stories. The other day, last year, I was in the Google I.O. conference, and I was finding my seat, and then suddenly I receive a text from a, from a friend, and he's telling me, I can see you from where you are, and I naturally stand up and I start looking for him. And little I know that I am plastered in the screen of the worldwide Google uh, I.O. conference. And my Twitter and my Facebook went crazy. And I had my five minutes of fame because the memes that day were about this guy, <laughs> right? From politics to Oscars, et cetera. Uh, but the point is I was looking for, I was looking for this guy well, not this guy, not, not, not John Travolta. I was looking for this guy, <laughs> Manolo Diaz. Manolo Diaz is the CEO and co-founder of a company called Yogome, a company that I invested in 2011 as an angel. And Manolo and his company, which is a game and education apps company, has been in the news lately because he just returned to the first uh, institutional investor eight times uh, the size of their, their fund just by the fund selling 25% of their stake in the company. This is a company founded by two guys from a little town in Mexico that just ra raised $30 million for their Series B for expansion in Asia and in uh, Latin America. But this is not the only case. Maybe you haven't heard about Mulaca, the Mexican game that is one of the best nindies from last year. Uh, and this year, early this year, sorry. But interesting things are happening in Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Turkey, Ukraine, etc. So the first idea and the first kind of uh, thing that I want to share with you is big things are happening and more importantly, about to happen in these territories, in emerging markets, regardless you hear about them and regardless you are there or not. Second story, quickly, I was hired by EA in 2006 to start the Latin America office down there. By the time, the value of the market was $300 million. Today is $4.1 billion, right? But this is not only Latin America. Southeast Asia is also growing tremendously. This is a market only with PC and mobile, uh, close to $2.2 billion. So the point is that if we put together these three emerging regions, right? Latin America, Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, we can see interesting numbers. 1.6 uh, billion people, 800 million connected users, 500 million active gamers. To me, it's pretty obvious where the next billion gamers are, right? But I think that is not the, is, is not the right or not the complete way to approach this story because it's not only about consumers. Within these billion new gamers, within these billion new people connected, there are developers too. According to Goldman Sachs, as you, can, uh, you know, there is these 11 countries that are uh, preparing themselves to become uh, GDP powerhouses of growth, innovation, etc. And I do believe that's true because if you take a look to the countries with the most engineering uh, graduates, you will see that 60% of them are in emerging markets. So what is underneath 
the peak of the iceberg. It's a story about the opportunity that emerging markets will offer, not only by approaching those markets from a consumer standpoint, but approaching those markets with the developers that are coming from there. And of course, this is going to be a story about the people that will invest in them. That's why the last uh, story that I want to share with you is only a GIF. Uh, and I think that I, sorry. That GIF is showing how we are trying to approach emerging markets. <laughs> Thank you so much. That next up is uh, JJ from Pearl Abyss, uh, best known for Black Desert Online. Come on up, JJ. Hi everyone, I'm JJ from Prolabis, the developer of Black Desert Online. I'm going to talk about games as a community today with a little compliments about some Korean game companies. So back in the old days, games were mostly considered like a package good. You build your game, launch it, and people buy it. After the internet became widely used in households, game companies also started doing things digital and went online. As more and more online games came out, live service and game updates became as important as the initial launch. But still, it was not until recently started talking about games as a service model this much. The games as a service perspective focuses on making the game's life cycle longer, working on the live service for your game to provide the new experience to your gamers as a continuous basis. Yet it's very important. But many people think there is a hidden notion of microtransaction business behind games as a service. And yes, it may be true that if you want to keep creating significant revenue for your five-year-old or even older game, there probably should be some forms of microtransaction business in there. And some people just don't like it. But I don't think that's, not, I don't think that's the point. Let's just step back and think, what are games? And what business are we in? I like to call games as a community instead of games as a service. When you said games as a service, it implies this linear one-way relationship between a game publisher as a service provider and players as a customer. Still, you emphasize how important it is to build a community for your game, but I still see the one-way relationship. We're all talking about this at this event, and now the world the game players are surrounded by is changed. The entire landscape in the game industry looks a little different with all these new social media and platforms where individuals even make money by playing games or just commenting on them. Some of the real good players now become professional gamers, and now they even make more money than a game producer. What's the implication? Now, your game community is not just limited to the group of people coming to your official forum anymore. You can't manage the community as you did before. Now, players promote your games through their personal networks or on their YouTube channels or on Twitch or literally everywhere. These people get connected to each other even without you as the game developer or publisher in the middle. But remember, your game actually created this bigger community and all these people are actually in your game community. Your game resides in the ecosystem where all these happen interrelated to each other. And now apparently it's really important you understand your community, who they are, what these people do and what they want and need, what they value, and how to keep the entire community live and excited. Let me tell you about this. In early 2000 in South Korea when I was still living there, most of the PC online gamers had a regular offline gatherings called the Jongmo. Jongmo literally means regular gatherings. It was the culture amongst Korean kids back then. They just go in and hang out with their in-game friends, making them real friends in the real world, but still calling each other in their in-game nicknames. And also in the old days when you bought a Pac-Man, you still talked about it with your friends, invited your friends over to play together, and that's the gamers community. You want to share it with other people. Your favorite games are a part of your life. And again, now the community means even more and bigger than any time in history. 
Expo community. Nexin and Ansysoft and other big Korean companies that are born in Korea in late 1990s or early 2000s all started with online games and MMORPGs. They all started with their business with online games and I think they naturally understood the importance of the games as a community business and that's what really raised them up initially, not a microtransaction business model. We Pearl Abyss is only eight year old company based in Korea, but our core team has an extensive MMORPG development and live service experience and our biggest focus has been always our game players community. When our game Black Desert Online was launched in the US, it actually got a lot of love and attention from the MMORPG fans. They loved our awesome character creation tool. They built up a community for our game on their own. In return for their love, we actually kept updating the game every week for the first year of the game release. If you were in an MMO dev team, you'd, you'd know how, it, how hard it is to update your game every week. But we just did it not because for the revenue, but just believe that that's what our players want. And we were ready for that, and all the efforts paid off. So game live service is a continuing nourishment for the community. It's not just about business model. You should work on to grow the community, expand your fan base, and I believe that's the best and probably the only way to make your game's life cycle longer and longer and also make any microtransaction business really meaningful. Your fans will love to pay for things they love. So in this new era where the game is leisure that we're talking about, one principle I think still holds true or even more true than before. Make players your biggest fans and your game be part of their life. Thank you. Thanks for that, uh, JJ. Coming up next, we have uh, Rana Sakar, who's Consul General of Canada in San Francisco. He's going to speak about talent. Hi, Rana. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, listen, I, I, I appreciate being here. You know, someone from the government, you know, we don't usually get to use slides very often, so, uh, so I'm not going to use any slides. Um, I, I've got uh, uh, I, I, just a few points to make here. Um, essentially, you know, we're in the business of uh, finding, curating better talent, uh, making sure that our economy is consistent with uh, the best of the tw what the 21st century has to offer. And the gaming industry is absolutely uh, central to what that is. And in Canada, for instance, it's a $3.7 billion industry. We have over 22,000 people uh, employed in the gaming industry, and it's growing at uh, 30 to 40 percent a year. I mean, this is an extraordinary number. We recognize that the gaming industry sets at the intersection of all of the major uh, revolutions that are taking place in digital entertainment. And, uh, and Canada is you know, uh, determined to uh, put policy together and also to attract and you know, get into better conversation with uh, uh, folks like you that are around the table. So we're trying to break our activities into about three different categories right now. One is the cultivation of talent. And this is about you know, not just in, you know, ensuring that we have uh, you know, today's talent, but we also have to, tomorrow's talent. We're graduating you know, uh, a, a significant uh, proportion of uh, engineering and STEM graduates every year. We've got uh, you know, dozens, if not, uh, I think up to 37 uh, schools right now that are digital media accredited, that are producing uh, literally thousands of graduates every year that are going into uh, these industries and looking at the gaming industry particularly as uh, a, a particularly good model. And co-op programs are a significant portion of that, you know, both, uh, you know, EA and EA Games uh, and Ubisoft have, uh, we've worked with them as well uh, to, you know, put co-op programs together to ensure that they have the next generation of talent that's, uh, that's going through those institutions. Um, we're also working closely and collaboratively with cities and, um, um, and, and provinces or, or state governments to ensure that we've got you know, support uh, all along the lines. And, uh, but most importantly, we're also working with the community itself and with tech and with, um, also with uh, uh, the, the, the community that would uh, provide all of the infrastructure for that and so the broader tech community as well. 
The second point that I'd say that we're, we're really looking at is curation. And we recognize that you know, companies don't exist in individually, they exist you know, in curated ecosystems. And, uh, and so we, are, uh, we, we have two policies that are actually really interesting to talk about because I think this is, it mirrors what folks in the rest of the world, and uh, you know, we're taking from some of the best examples of the rest of the world, but others I think uh, equally are looking at this as well. And one is the creation of what we call a super cluster fund. And so we've got about a billion dollars going into uh, you know, eight or nine different industry segments, one of which is the, uh, the, the digital media in, uh, industry. And, uh, and so that's up to $250 million of capital that gets matched into, in, into capital that, uh, that individual companies put in as well. And uh, the other policy that we have that I think is really interesting is just around you know, making sure that you've got the right people at the right places. And so one of that is a, what we call a global skills strategy, which, you know, for instance, if you want to get global talent into your company, we can you know, guarantee a 10-day or a two-week turnaround um, in terms of a visa. And if it's for a short-term uh, project, we can, you can do it immediately. So that's a pretty significant part of it. And, and what that does as well is that incur encourages the, um, uh, the retention of talent as well. So we have a very high talent retention rate, so you're not losing talent as, uh, uh, as, as, as the process goes on. And so that's something that you know, we're putting in the window right now. And I think it's, it's becoming really attractive for a lot of tech companies and, and gaming companies in there. And the third, what I would say is uh, that we're really focusing on is this idea of circulation. The reason why we're down here, there are over 300,000 Canadians in the broader Bay Area, you know, and so half of them put up their hands and the other half, you know, you, know, you choose to keep quiet in some instances. But what that, what that really means, though, is um, there are a lot of people coming back and forth. And that idea of back and forth, not just between Canada and the United States, but also globally, the circulation of talent, the breadth of talent, and what we're looking to do in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the economies of the future are going to be created by a super diverse workforce. And in Toronto, for instance, just to give you one example, there's over 50% of the population, or I think it's just at 48% right now, um, um, weren't born in Canada. So the experiments of scale that are taking place in terms of diversity in Canada are pretty extraordinary. What that means for talent and people that are in the talent business is it's a great place to be churning, making sure you're going back and forth. So if you're not there already, you know, uh, make sure that you've got some capacity to you know, get access to some of that talent or work with some of the companies. And so I think that that's just our example in Canada, but I think what you're seeing around the world from you know, the, the, the Singapore to the Dubai to what's going on in China, what's happening in India, everyone's recognizing the importance of openness, diversity, and talent and the creation of the infrastructure that goes behind that. And so I think that that's something that I hope you take away, away from right now because all of the, the other aspects of business model design, the things that we need to do is from my private sector, old private sector hat, all of that rests on that other foundation. So uh, I'll leave you at that and thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, Rana, fantastic stuff. Next up, we've got Amar Zaim from Caramel Tech Studios, which is a developer of mobile games. Hi, Amar. Hey guys, so uh, we make games in Lahore, Pakistan, and there was a time when people used to ask me, do you guys have computers over there? So uh, yeah, we've come a long way. Uh, we, um, a brief history about us is uh, when, when I was 12, my brother was 14, uh, we weren't allowed to use the computer until we did something productive with it. Uh, so we set up a uh, web developing company and that uh, that did a little bit of business we we made it six hundred dollars which was great money for us at that time and uh, moving forward that kind of put the seed in our head that you know we want to do something in tech and we watched the movie Pirates of the Silicon Valley got super inspired by uh, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates uh, Anyway, uh, moving forward, when uh, my, my brother had a short stint at a startup, and he called me once, and he's like, we're getting back into tech, and we're going to make mobile games. I'm like, how are we going to do that? And uh, go, uh, so we started off uh, from our room. We, we don't have garages there, so 
Um, we, we planned it out all there, and uh, we started emailing people, uh, you know, getting people on LinkedIn, uh, started figuring out how to, you know, hire people. And, uh, you know, all in all, in one year, uh, we generated $1 million in revenue, which was great. Um, and we, we invested all of that and set up a, a whole office, took up a 5,000 square feet uh, building and everyone thought we were crazy because uh, we're investing all our money towards that. And we, we, f we figured that locally the biggest problem is people at that time did not believe in startups. They wanted stable jobs and uh, we had to provide that and we had to make them believe that if well, if they had to work, we're, we're going all in with it. Uh, and, and that's how, uh, you know, that's how it all started. Uh, we're about 50 people now. Uh, we've, we've been, uh, you know, uh, j uh, making games with Kabam. We've worked with Half Brick. We took Fruit Ninja cross-platform, which was a big breakthrough for us. Uh, we work with EA and, uh, you know, Eight years down the line, we're, we're making our own products. Uh, we've trained the team where people knew engineering. They were fresh graduates, but they didn't know a lot about gaming. Uh, and now they've, they've worked with some top tier studios where they've learned so much. And it's, it's just phenomenal that how, how people who, who thought they couldn't develop you know, creative games uh, over there and they could only play them are now working with these great studios. Uh, moving forward, uh, uh, we, we realized that uh, one of the biggest goals for us is creating jobs um, and creating high quality uh, environments and everything. Uh, so uh, we, we started talking a lot about that, uh, how, how we drive culture within the company and that helped everyone understand within locally. So when we started, there were about three to four mobile game studios. Now there are about 50 all over the country. And there's a lot of content generation over there. Uh, there's, there's still a legacy issue uh, where people are still learning about mobile games and how, how, to, how to penetrate in the global market because locally, there are a lot of downloads, like India, but uh, where, where we struggle is monetization because of payments and everything. So, so it's, it's a long journey towards having generate revenue with localized content, but, but the way the school system works over there is that it's totally Western focused. So we kind of understand it more than some of our neighbors like China, which is huge now. Uh, so so it's, it's been the focus over here, so we, uh, everyone goes to GDC every year, learns more about what, what the West is doing, and you know, try to understand that. For instance, our, our evolution was working with Fruit Ninja, learning about premium, and suddenly we, we know that premium has really kicked off, and, uh, and we moved towards that, and then we, we built a game with great numbers, and then we find out, oh, user acquisition costs are crazy, the game's not going to be ROI positive. So it's been a great learning uh, process, but as entrepreneurs, we always realize that the key to success would be retaining the team, retaining the talent, uh, having to struggle for a couple of years, and then once you have all of that in place, make the mistakes, you will be able to uh, be successful. So. So it's, it's been a great journey and uh, you know, Lahore is, is the hub of tech in Pakistan now and it's growing really fast. Uh, and yeah, I mean, so overall I, I, I feel that uh, Pakistan is gonna be uh, you know, a big hub in developing great mobile games uh, and hopefully console games pretty soon. So yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Man. Fascinating, man. fascinating. Okay, next up we've got Mike Schwartz from Scalefast. He's going to be talking about personalized e-commerce. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mike Schwartz. I am from a company called Scalefast. 
I lost a bet last night to Christian, so I came to do a uh, speech to you about my boring life. Um, so, <laughs> joking aside, so, uh, so ScaleFast is, uh, we do technology, services, and infrastructure to sell stuff online, particularly video games. We have some great game publishers. Usual engagements kind of sounds like, like, uh, Mike, oh, thank God you're here. Um, hey, it's a... Uh, it's like the 10th of April and E3 is in about six or seven weeks and we're about uh, nine months behind on launching this game or new collector's edition. Uh, globally, we need to sell it into about 157 different countries and 27 different currencies and we have no idea how we're about to get this done, but like, we're way under budget. Can you just do it for us? And ScaleFast comes in and we're like, si se puede. Yes, we can. We can do it. <laughs> so like, you know, so the main value prop is you globalize the store to the game publishers, and um, the really cool, interesting thing right now in e-commerce is probably in all of your spaces as well, is uh, personalization using artificial intelligence to make uh, online experiences more relevant for consumers. So when you, when you start getting into that space, you know, like as, as, a, as a total industry, we're not super good at it yet, we're kind of figuring it out, but you know, when you think about it, it's actually pretty simple, and I can think of no better interpersonal example of selling something uh, than getting to know my fantastic in-laws. And so, you know, it's the same thing. You basically, you, you meet this guy, Eric, he's great. He has the cleanest home of any human I've ever met in my life, you know, quick observation. And then you meet Shelly, who's super sweet. But if she beats you, or if you beat her in like backgammon or checkers, she will like turn into like Conor McGregor and like throw like a, garbage can through a window and like freak out. So it's pretty simple. You want them to love you and like you, you just, you know, you clean the hell out of the kitchen, you, you know, bleach the thing from floor to ceiling, and you just let her beat you in checkers or back in, whatever it is. You know, and so what's going on there is that there's a behavioral, you know, you understand the behavior, you're segmenting wants and needs, and then you're uh, creating an offer, you know, and both of these guys are getting different user experiences, but they're buying the same product, which is yours, truly. So as where the industry right now is, as a whole, is you know really really good at pulling behavioral data. So video game publishers, especially developers, they have so much telemetry and you know behavior that they can pull out of a game to really really know somebody probably better than their family because you know we spend more time playing games than we do at the dinner table. But like segmenting that data in an easy way, tools to do segmentation. You know like there's Google Analytics and there's all kinds of other tools, but there's nothing really that segments users in real time that's that I know of at least. And then there's certainly not a product out there that will create offers depending on that segmentation and that behavioral data. So I'm gonna give you a really simple, super simple example, and it's kind of cute. Uh, we're gonna take two gamers. One is called Dwight Schrute. Does anybody like The Office? Show of hands. So at least there's three people that will understand my inside joke, that's awesome. Uh, and then there's Dean Takahashi, and I'm gonna let you guess what their favorite video game is. And it's not Cuphead, okay? <laughs> so uh, it's not Beats, it's not Bears, it's, come on. Nobody watched, you guys don't even watch The Office. I can't believe it. It's Battlestar Galactica, for God's sake. <laughs> so when Dwight and Dean show up to the Battlestar Galactica uh, online playing environment, uh, they're both seeing the exact same experience. Pre-apologies to anybody here if you potentially worked on this project for Battlestar Galactica, but like we all know that Dean loves the human faction, and we all know that S Dwight is basically a robot and loves Cylon, right? And both of them will buy as much DLC as you shop them, and they really like the old version of Battlestar Galactica that was really cool like in the 70s and the 80s. So give them experiences, just acknowledge who they are when they land on you know, the store or whatever it is the, inside the, uh, the online game environment and give them something that's relevant. So like, when Dwight shows up, give him Cylon DLC, and show them both old school, cool, retro characters, and give them, you know, give Dean uh, the human thing, human faction. And like, it works, it's great. Uh, it, this is something that is, it's dumb and simple, and that's why it's so great, right? You, you get better engagement with your audience, they actually care about what they're seeing when they land or wherever they're going. Uh, they'll pay you more because they'll have more fun and uh, it's way less expensive to manage that experience because a machine is basically doing it for you. You don't have to segment and then create offers and go back a month later and figure out what worked. And that's it, and that is totally gonna change the way that we operate, and at least from an e-commerce standpoint. And that's it. Thank you so much for being here and listening, and that's it, thank you. Thanks, Mike. 
So last up, we have Dave Miller from Atheron Games. He's going to be talking about console free-to-play, which is a thing right now. Come on up, Dave. Thank you, Colin. Back in 2009, I uh, read what is still one of my favorite articles on the gaming industry. It was uh, written by Trent Pollock, published in Gama Sutra, and he was very frustrated because he was reading an article on the best video games of all time, and all of them were made after 2000. And they didn't reflect the games that he and his friends primarily liked to play. Uh, and if you look at what actually sold well and was highly rated in 2008, um, this is a good selection. We're all familiar with these franchises. Most of these are lovingly handcrafted games. Um, they're story driven, very long play sessions, and a ton of checkpoints because you don't want to lose hours and hours of deep uh, play through a lot of these console games. But it didn't really fit the way that the new generation lived. And Trent said, you need to build games to adjust to the way your players live. And all of these games I just mentioned were designed by, played by, and rated by Gen X, who doesn't like to play well with others and enjoys these deep, punishing, hardcore experiences. Um, but that was changing. And now this seems like old news. It's generally accepted. But at the time, it was pretty eye-opening. And the new generation liked to play together. They were much more social. They wanted to do things with each other. They preferred shorter cycles, um, plenty of feedback, preferably positive. Um, and they liked to do everything with friends rather than alone and solitary. So he was making the point that for games to continue to survive and thrive, we need to adjust the, to the way the new generation lives, which tends to be very social and together. So about that time, uh, mobile was starting to make inroads. And uh, it was the first exposure of free to play, really, to, to most Western game players was through mobile. And boy, did it take off fast. By early 2012, over half of all mobile revenue was generated through in-app purchases, which to core console gamers who were already rubbed a bit raw from the slow departure from the deep uh, single player experiences, this was just becoming too much to bear. But it accelerated. Six months later, 80% or 70% of that revenue came from in-app purchases, and then a little over a year later, it was up to 80%. So the free-to-play model was definitely here to stay and moving forward. But what made the actual game itself work, aside from the business model? Well, we see a lot of social interaction, quick, quick rewarding feedback loops, and a wide variety of experiences, which sounds really familiar if you were reading Trent's article back in 2009. So now we're in late 2013, entering 2014, uh, mobile is exploding, free-to-play is exploding on there. What's happening in the console market? Um, it's a sort of multiple stories happening, but the big one is that the middle class of games is no longer working. You used to be able to make a 70, 75% rated game, put it out there at $59, and you generally had a pretty good shot at, at breaking even or making some money if you had a decent marketing team and start building awareness properly. Well, with development costs rising to 70, 80, 100 million dollars on console games, there's very few publishers willing to take a risk on an independent development team at that level. Uh, it just became too scary, especially when you needed to have that incredibly high quality level. So you had independent console developers getting absorbed into publishers, uh, which is great for many of them. And then the rest of them out there, if you owned your own IP, that's great. You could generally make a pretty lucrative publishing deal with a major publisher and continue to do well. But for everyone else, you're doing Kickstarters, uh, you're doing work for hire, which is great because it pays the bills, but you're always out there hunting and you only eat what you kill in that case. Uh, or you're making a go on Steam, which was a really good model for a while. And a lot of people established themselves new development teams on Steam with, with original IP. Um, the problem is, and if you saw the GDC uh, speech by, Game, by GameSpy last month, is Steam is becoming really, really crowded. So of the over 21,000 games on Steam right now, Almost 40% of them were released last year alone, just in 2017. Uh, and that makes for fewer games uh, available per, per person, right? You've got way too much supply out there, and everyone is going to continue to buy um, more and more games just because there's more available. So if you look at all the games available on Steam right now, the average rate of ownership is about 9,500. So each game has about 9,500 customers who has purchased it. But if you look at indie games on Steam, that number drops to 5,000. And if you look at indie games on Steam that were released last year, now you're down to 1,500. So if you take 1,500 copies and multiply, multiply it by, say, $20, it's not a lot of money. Um, probably covers one person just above minimum wage for a year. Uh, so not, uh, not an easy model to win on. So what's a good console developer to do now? Um, you're used to building uh, great AAA games. Um, the market has become a little bit more difficult. Well, look at Digital Extremes for an example. So in 2013, Digital Extremes bet the house on a small project they had called Warframes, a free-to-play game 
um, that they had a lot of passion about. They wanted to change kind of the direction of the company. They believed in free to play and wanted to make this work. So they put all their resources into Warframe, but they approached it differently from console development in the past. It wasn't about uh, managing a publisher, managing your community, uh, trying to keep people away from development. As JJ mentioned earlier, um, the key to success on this is embracing your community, and Digital Extremes did that. They opened it up, they welcomed the community in, they didn't just listen to the community, they made the community a part of the game. And they were reacting weekly with new content in the game and responding and crediting individual people for their contributions to it. And over the next uh, five years, Warframe continued to grow and grow, and it's one of the dominant free-to-play games right now on console and PC. Uh, and that was 2013. Now go to late 2017, and Fortnite adds a Battle Royale mode um, that is free uh, on their game, and it explodes. Uh, Superdata says in February of 2018 alone, Fortnite generated $126 million in revenue, which is incredible. Um, but none of this should really be a huge surprise, because going back again to 2009, uh, we know what is starting to work now in gaming. It's a lot of social interaction, quick feedback loops, um, and, and shorter gameplay loops. And that's exactly what Fortnite brings, what Warframe brings, and, and the type of thing that free-to-play offers. So suddenly, free-to-play AAA console games are legitimate. Um, players love them, they enjoy spending money on the game, they celebrate new materials that the developer has released as long as players are part of the community. If you bring them in, they feel ownership for the game and it becomes their game. They help promote it, they love it, they celebrate each other within the game. Um, it's, a, it's a good place to be if you're a console development team. Another great thing about console free to play is the pay rate is much, much higher than mobile, about four times mobile on average, and that's because console players are used to spending money. Um, it's not a stretch for them. So you'll see on average about 15%. We've seen up to 20% of the player base actually spend money on a game for console and PC free-to-play, which is a, a very lucrative market, especially versus the, uh, the mobile numbers where you've got to have an enormous number of players to make the small pay rate actually pay off. But perhaps the best thing about being in console free-to-play is it'll relieve the anxiety and replace that with this sort of rush that a developer will get when you know you're building a game that your players love. Every week, every month, you're able to revisit it. You can develop new content. You can bring in your biggest fans, help develop new material based on what they're saying. And it'll give you the stability to be able to hire great people, to have confidence in your investments, maybe even pursue some pet projects that you've wanted to build on the side that you could never do in the past because you were constantly hunting uh, for work of some type. So how are we involved in this at Athlon Games? So our goal is to bring Eastern free-to-play monetization techniques and combine it with Western IP and Western development sensibilities. Bringing Eastern games to the West does not work, um, but the monetization systems that have formed the foundation of free-to-play in the West all come from Asia. So that is our goal now, which we believe is fairly unique. Um, we have acquired digital extremes and splash damage. Um, we have a relationship with Max Hoberman, Certain Affinity in Austin, who's working on a very large AAA free-to-play game. Uh, and we bring funding. We'll help fund the development of the game. We'll fund a live operations and monetization team and teach you uh, the way that free-to-play works, the way that we'd like to see it. Essentially, it's a blueprint. We'll show you how the plumbing and electrical systems should be put in, and then the development team gets to build a big, beautiful house or resort or whatever they'd like it to be on top, which is the game experience itself. So for independent console developers who are trying to figure out what to do next, and I know a lot of you do not want to go to mobile, you want to continue making the type of games you've been making, we're here. We'd love to talk to you about it, and we offer full global publishing support. We have a publishing headquarters in Los Angeles with branches in London and Beijing, and we manage first-party relationships uh, with the console teams as well as traditional uh, publishing. So if you'd like to hear more, um, please come see me, or many of you I'm sure know Richard Brown, who runs our uh, production team. Email address is on screen. Thanks very much. Have a great show. Thanks very much, Dave. Thank you to all our speakers who've given us lots of insights and variety. I'm going to hand back to Andrea now. Thanks very much.